Okay, so today we are going to be reviewing this video that Dratnos did in this interview um, with Steve Denuser and Morgan Day and talking about some of the things that they discussed in this interview. Um, overall, very interesting interview. You can check the description to get the link to the actual video. I would, I would highly recommend going and looking at the uh, actual link. We're going to be reviewing um, basically what they went over, talking about some of the main high points and, and just kind of in general giving my thoughts on this interview that Dratnos did with them. I'm Dratnos. I, I do some World of Warcraft content, PvE stuff, M+, raids mostly. Yeah, Dratnos looking uh, good. And really excited to be here to get to interview both of you. But uh, what would be, I guess, a, a quick description of what you both are up to and responsible for? Very cool. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of yours. Wow. Uh, I'm excited to be able to talk to you today. Wow. Um, yeah, my name is Morgan Day. I am one of the associate game directors on World of Warcraft. And Steve Denuser, I'm the narrative director on World of Warcraft. I just wore this shirt on the on the MDI desk. Sunday? Did he record this video after after MDI on Sunday? Okay. So or is I he just start recycling with, shirts uh, with some Mythic Plus stuff? I'm sure other people are going to ask about the affixes. I'm sure that part is going to be a frequent question. So I'm going to leave that. We'll leave that for those interviews. Let's talk about the four dungeons that were picked to he return recorded it during for the break this yeah, season. Shit. Because Vortex Pinnacle, Vortex Pinnacle, that's a that's a Cataclysm dungeon. We're going back yeah. all the way uh, yeah. there. The, this, the way way back machine. <laughs> yeah, a dungeon with some dragons in it as well. So mm -hmm. maybe a narrative tie-in, I guess. There or totally. Um, also, I I told Steve beforehand. I was like, ah, oh, Dratnos, he's just going to ask you nothing but lore questions. So. <laughs> I love no. I <laughs> well, there's there's lore in these dungeons. There's uh, not wrong, not wrong. there's a lot of story here. Oh no, totally. Should... Dratnos, the RP here. Dreadnus was a knower? Yeah, Dreadnus was a knower. So fucked up. You're, that's a great question, actually, and I'm happy to talk about it. Right, so, you know, the Season 2 Mythic Plus pool, uh, I, I'm sure as you saw, but I'll just repeat, right? Like, um, the other four um, Dragonflight dungeons that were not in Season 1, so Notharis, uh, Oldemon, Halls of Infusion, the, uh... Halls of, there's so many, um, Brackenhide, um, and the other four, which I believe was what your question was in regards to, are Underrot, Freehold, Notharian's Lair, and Vortex Pinnacle. Somehow, and I don't even know how this happened, this was one of the worst kept secrets in the M Plus community. I don't even know how it didn't get leaked. Like, somebody, I'm surprised that nobody leaked it on stream. Because this this had to be one of the worst kept secrets in the M Plus community. I knew about this. I don't, I don't normally get stuff very early, but I got told about this, like, maybe two weeks ago by somebody like random, not even, not even by like anybody. Wow. Like wow. Team related. It was like somebody random. This had to be one of the worst kept secrets in the M plus community was that these, these were the dungeons. This is crazy. Um, so I'm in terms of just like, I'm the stunned that it didn't get leaked on stream those, um, by somebody. It was actually a couple different things. There was not like a singular point that led to these four. It was more just like a, uh, multiple different things. Right. So, Neltharian's Lair, right? Like Embers of Neltharis with our 10.1 content update. Like there's yeah. obvious um, lore tie-ins there, right? Like Drogbar. there's Drogbar and we're going to see Drogbar again in um, the Zerlek Cavern. And, you know, Neltharian's Legacy is a huge part of this content update. And this dungeon has tie-ins there as well. So that one just seemed like an obvious slam dunk. Um, Vortex Pinnacle also has some pretty fun tie-ins, like you said, with the dragons, as well as some of the fun elemental stuff. Um, and also, this was an opportunity for us to, like you called out, you know, kind of test the waters of, you know, how far back can we go? Is Cataclysm too far? Um, so many fake leaks all got covered up. Yeah, to do yeah, to bring that's maybe true. To today's so many fake leaks that got covered up. Um, the gameplay expectations. Uh, you know, we we obviously, you know, have done some of our older dungeons, and we don't want to have a repeat of Shadow and Burial Grounds, where there's one kind of outlier in terms of the challenge of it. Um, so we want to be careful with how... Dude, okay, that's actually that's actually a really good point. I, I'm, I think that I think that I kind of commend Morgan's awareness. So sometimes sometimes it's actually pretty easy to just kind of sweep this kind of this kind of thing under the rug and be like, oh yeah, you know, Quarter Stars and Shadow Moon Burial Grounds kind of released a little bit imbalanced relative to the other dungeons. But Morgan addressing that and being like, yeah, we are we are releasing these old dungeons. Um, the gameplay expectations. But like there is uh, there is this gameplay expectation that the dungeons are going to be balanced well relative to one another. That and talking about that in relation to Vortex Pinnacle is actually so sick because obviously Cato is a different era, um, and I think that it makes sense that like, uh, 
you know, we we yeah. obviously more help, you know, have I guess? done some of our older dungeons, and we don't want to have a repeat of Shadowman Burial Grounds where there's one kind of outlier in terms good take. of the challenge of it. Um, so we want to be careful with how we approach that. That's a really that was good take. Kind of the idea there. Um, Freehold just felt like uh, if we don't do this, uh, we'll get letters. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like this is a fan favorite. You know, we always take a look at these. You know, community lists that we see. When God, I love Freehold. Such a good dungeon. Like, I mean, in general, the reason that Freehold was such a good dungeon was because of, like the trash design, right? That's why. That's why I was always the big fan favorite. Is just like. I, th I think the design of trash is is so cool in there it, it really allowed you to kind of flex your dps in a lot of ways and i think that that's one of the big things and on top of that you're able to kind of route in a bunch of different um route like in a bunch of different ways talking about like hey nice. what old dungeons you want to see so fun very cool yeah, exactly that's what i'm saying near the top of it definitely uh, makes so the entire like I agree. good day uh, and then under was actually a bit of a curveball here in terms of expectations um we look at our Mythic Plus pool and our dungeons for Mythic Plus, like a package of content, the same way that we look at a raid. Um, and we want to make sure that we're testing different types of combat and, you know, utility and capabilities of our players. So we were really looking for something to kind of round out that Mythic Plus package with Underrot. You have a lot of really fun uh, opportunities to use utility. There's different dispel types in there. There's lots of different profiles in terms of um, the damage profiles, you mm -hmm. know, versus AOE versus single target. Um, the routing in there always felt like it was kind of This is a weird one. Uh, and there's lots of room for exploration there. So we wanted to kind of bring that back more to fill out the gameplay experience and round out that that um, seasonal package. Yeah, I think I think that that's actually a really interesting answer in regards to like Underrot. Um, uh, un Underrot is is a dungeon that I, I do find very interesting. It's like a it. It's definitely one of the best non-standard dungeons from bfa and what i mean when i say there's like a free freehold was like a you know just like an aoe experience kind of thing that's like a fan favorite under was a good dungeon but it was good because like because it wasn't like so imbalanced it was like a pretty linear dungeon which generally players don't love but i think it was designed in a way that you felt like you had a like a decent amount of unique stuff and something that morgan had on was the the pathing i think is like a pretty um interesting experience i i'm surprised that they went and went to this in regards to like, oh, we're looking at different damage profiles that are valuable in the dungeon. Underrod is definitely a dungeon that has a lot more priority damage focused um, pulls than other keys. I mean, even if you think about like the first pull of Underrod, look, look at this part of Underrod that they have highlighted here. This pull, you would literally focus down this this Broodmother, right? Every single time, as opposed to this the remaining trash. If you ever pulled it into any of these larvae, you would also focus this down, so yeah. Yeah, Underrod's always been one of my favorite dungeons. And one thing that was interesting about it was that Story-wise, it's this place where we're under the ground. It's an old god facility or a, a titan facility with some old god corruption getting involved, right? Sounds awfully similar to the Avarice raid as well. Is there some element of that, you know, coming up that's uh, helped make it be part of the pick as well? I'll let Steve answer that one. Well, yeah, that's that's an interesting observation. Tyrannical uh, 30, correct. That, that, that's true. Us, that, yeah. That'll be quite tough. I, I mean, I think that... Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that they're bringing back Kragma. Be some ties there, but yeah, it's uh, there's definitely some thematic echoes, and and uh, I think that it, uh, yeah, it was it was just a cool dungeon space too, and uh, I agree with and that. one that uh, it seemed like a good time to revisit it. So sometimes the stars align, and and there's multiple reasons for including a dungeon in a in a in a season like this. Okay, so more on the story then. One thing that I noticed about Shadowlands was when we came into Shadowlands, we had a pretty good idea, right? We'd be fighting Sylvanas at some point, the Jailer at some point. One thing about Dragonflight is at the start of this expansion, we didn't, we had no idea who was going to be the 10.1 bad guy. We kind of still don't. Maybe it's the Scale Commander, Sarkareth, uh, fellow. But then we have no idea who's 10.2, 10.3 uh, enemies, anything like that. We're kind of learning with these cinematics that we get at the end of a raid, at the start of this next patch. Uh, it's a lot more like episodic development mm -hmm. and deployment of the story. Is that was that a conscious choice to kind of move away from the Shadowlands? Dude, we know what's coming to uh, more exploration. I can't. Well, I would say that um, yeah, I can't we, stop we but looking at. The, hold on, okay. um, pause for a sec. I can't stop but looking at the fact that this is just like off pixel wise, right? 
This is clearly put in in post production. Dude, this is like just off. <laughs> Like there, there's like four or five pixels to the right here that this is just off. This is like overlapping with the box, of whatever Dratnos talks and shit. Um, like the oh, antagonists God. played out in Shadowlands and how they did in, in oh, previous expansions as well. Can't We're help myself but look seeing, at it. You know what patterns can we learn from? What can we do better uh, in terms of unfolding this? And one of the things that we really wanted to do uh, in Dragonflight was to um, kind of set the table with multiple forces of antagonism that could play out in maybe a less predictable pattern than um, you'd seen before. So in this case, you know, when you think back through from the start of Dragonflight um, and what we've seen so far, um, at the end of the, the, the Drakthir experience, we do have Sarkareth uh, who breaks away from the other Drakthir and with this group that he renames the Sundered Flame. And um, we, you get to see them in questing a few times, seeing that kind of darker turn that they're going. And we'll delve into that much deeper in our 1007 update. Okay. Um, the return to the Forbidden Reach, we'll see um, his story play out some more and, and how Emberthal is trying to pull him back from this path that seems to be headed towards darkness. And sure enough, it leads underground into um, Zeralek Cavern and, and the Avarice Raid as well. So um, that's one of the antagonists that we've been setting up. Um, we also have the Incarnates, who were the other three were freed after we defeated Razageth in the Vault of the Incarnates. Um, and so we're picking up their storyline. And um, they are, you know, this group of three very powerful elemental dragons. Okay, so the Incarnate storyline is definitely the only I am so bad at lore, but the Incarnate storyline is so sick. And they have kind of a long game that we're seeing, you know, gradually uh, play out in different ways. We'll get to spend some quality time with Farak in Embers of, of Neltharion because he goes underground, feeds upon this font of magma energy, and then he proceeds up to the surface and, and, and unleashes that power in uh, Farak assaults uh, in different places in the, in the overrealm world. Um, so that gives us a chance to get outside of Zeralek and, and go back to these uh, other zones that we really enjoy. And then there's other things too. I like too, it because they don't um, you know, uh, the picture road, them as fundamentally um, evil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well I think see. that that's cool. Other it there definitely is, makes you think, like, um, the threat that the are we the bad people here? Posed. Um, there's all kinds of stuff bubbling there under the surface, and uh, you'll see how these threads kind of intertwine and come together to tell the entire kind of picture of the storyline of Dragonflight. Yeah, I love that we're going to be coming back up to the base Dragonflight zones. One thing that this expansion introduced as well was the idea of the Renown tracks as replacements for the major reputations, just having the friendly, exalted, you know, honored levels. Are there going to be new Renown levels for the Ooh. existing four factions? Is that a system this that's is getting expanded upon? Really? Um, this is an interesting no, question. Not that I can remember. No plans to expand okay. the existing Renown tracks that I can think of, but there it will, will be a new renowned track that you'll be introduced to um, with the Niffin, who are kind of the like mole people uh, of the, the Zeralek Cavern, where, you know, we'll get, we'll, we'll meet them very early on and be introduced to a system like that for them. Um, but yeah, I mean, Steve mentioned this, but uh, we do want to, um, you know, make sure that Zeralek Cavern cool. what the fuck? feels additive, right? It's not something that is replacing all of the content in the outdoor world that people have been experiencing. Like that was something we heard some feedback on earlier on, like, you know, these cooking events and all these fun fishing events that feel very social and public. We are actually going to be updating a lot of those to be still relevant in season two. So their item level rewards will be increased there. So that this feels like Zerilek is something that you're experiencing alongside uh, a lot of these uh, core dragonfly zones. What sort is this guy talking about? And we really wanted to, There's no sword. you know, make sure that it feels cohesive, right? Like even just traveling to Zerilek, there's actually multiple entrances to the zone um, as you fly around Dragon the the Dragon Isles, where you'll be able to access it from multiple different zones, and making that feel like, you know, a cohesive experience. Like you'll there's a long old tunnel that you'll have a lot of fun dragon riding down and through. Um, that you will traverse through to get to Zerla Caverns from okay. those up, up, upstairs, I guess we could call them <laughs> zones. Um, you know, no load screens or anything like that. It should feel like a very cohesive um, end game experience. I think that another thing that's actually kind of cool too is like the Forbidden Reach area. Uh, so one of the the ten point zero point seven update is actually just going to give us a new zone on top of that too. And I think that like Blizzard giving us like a full fledged zone with you know this dragon riding enabled as well and and all of this other stuff that's going into 10.0.7 on top of 
the 10.1 content update which sounds like which was what morgan was just speaking on right there this is so cool i think i think that um i think that how this expansion has been designed from like an open world perspective has actually been quite strong Okay, speaking of keeping item levels current, there were a couple of systems with this patch that I'm curious how like a part of the interview. you were happy with God. the item level rewards of, such as the profession items. Is that something that we're going to continue and we're going to upgrade existing ones into next patch? Are they going to be the same relative item level to, you know, more normal heroic mythic raid? Uh, yeah, or, absolutely. Yeah. Um, overall, we're really, really happy with professions, right? Like we spent a tremendous amount of effort kind of refurbishing that system for Dragonflight. Um, and introduced a bunch of really cool stuff like crafting orders, you know, like I've been engaging with that so much. Okay. I'm really interested in seeing if he talks about embellishments, right? Because I think that embellishment effects are something that was like kind of interesting in uh, 10.0, but I think that they absolutely can be expanded upon or maybe even we get new embellishments in 10.1. Uh, I think that that's actually something that would be super cool. I, I, wonder, I wonder what he's going to say about that. Uh, not only just public ones, but also my own guild. Like, it's not uncommon that I'll throw out a public one just to get something ASAP, and then I'll go take my infusion and ask a guildie to upgrade it later. Um, so those are definitely things that we talked about and are really pleased with how those played out. Okay, um, I so agree yeah, with that. Definitely expanding that into uh, the Embers of Neltharian update. Um, and like you said, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but definitely keeping them relatively the same so that they are powerful. You will want some crafted items. Um, those are definitely things that, you know, when you get your spark for the week, you're going to be excited about what you can start to craft. Um, and in terms of like upgrading the existing items, I believe that's the current plan. Not only yeah. are there cool new recipes to want to potentially pursue with your embellishments, but also um, existing ones uh, come forward. So, you know, if you love your Lariat, uh, you'll be able to upgrade that. Okay. So, it's not, I mean, it sounds like it sounds like we're getting new new embellishment effects, which I, I, think, is a, I think is a step in the right direction. I think that the crafting profession... Difficult to digest is what I would say about it. Not it definitely wasn't the easiest thing to figure out how the hell it worked at the very beginning, but I think that it. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense that they're going to continue to try to iterate on the crafting system just as a whole because it was one of the. It's one of the better things, especially for players who aren't doing infinite. How about um, the um, like raid so the mythic primal storm and system came in this patch. It, it came with the. Fairly low item level rewards a couple weeks into the patch as well. Then in 10.1, we're going to have the Farak assaults. Is the plan there to be a sort of similar level of, okay, this is some good catch up that you can do if, or gear if you're interested in only exploring the world by yourself, but we want this to be a bit worse than you can get from the group content? Right. I mean, the outdoor world kind of has their own progression track that we look at as almost like a, you know, its own parallel uh, op option for people to experience and people who don't want to do that group content right we want them to have something that they can pursue um actually a really big change like a pretty huge change with this um embers of the update is actually we're essentially revamping the item upgrade system um something that we identified oh, was interesting there are a lot of discrete item upgrade systems right like storms have their own path to progression yeah. for upgrading um, Valor has its own path. There's all these discrete things that all are essentially achieving the same Even goals, crafting but too. you have to go about them in different ways, which can cause some confusion for the players. Um, so we're kind of looking to unify that under, you know, the one upgrade system to rule them all, right? <laughs> so there will be new a new currency called Flight Stones that will be the currency that I kind of always compare it to almost like um, like XP, right? Like, are you doing a thing? You're going to get some Flight Stones. Okay. And we'll make sure that you're, you're getting a good uh, mix of that. And then there are crests that will have different names like shadow flame crest and uh, dragon crest or i don't know the names off the top of my head um that are more of the currency that you'll need um that is essentially like testing your high water mark right like okay what mythic plus number have you done cool you'll get this one which will allow you to kind of break into a new tier of item upgrade or okay cool you killed a heroic boss you'll get this other type of crest okay. that will let you this makes you know, sense. unlock that item's uh potential for upgrading so um, very much trying to create kind of one system that other a lot of different elements of the game can tie into rather than it feeling like, wait, I have all these different currencies and they're, this is for these items and this is for these items. And what's going on here? So trying to simplify that significantly um, was a major goal and just add kind of some clarity as well as some um, really awesome reward hooks for people. Um, so, you know, so it sounds like it sounds like they're they're merging primal infusions, right? The primal focuses with uh so like the, it sounds like they're trying to merge the crafting system with 
honor and valor. So it sounds like like you know M plus is getting merged with crafting, which is getting merged with like all vendor currencies are just going to be under the same bucket. Um, in addition to that, the the primal focuses or primal infusions that you would get from killing mythic raid bosses are also going to be a part of that as well as what it sounds like. That's so interesting. How the new system applies to the valor cap? Oh, that's a really good question too. Like how would the how does the valor cap factor into this kind of thing? Um, is Valor still going to be like a major gated currency or is this going to be a situation where it's it's Valor gated and concentrated primal focus gated? Because that could be a thing too, right? Where it's it's gated behind two separate currencies. Um, but it may be a situation where it's only gated, you know, behind the, the primal focuses. But it sounds like it replaces Valor. Yeah, I agree with that. It, sound, it does sound like it replaces Valor. No, the PTR will be uh, later this week. Uh, is the goal. I hope it does as well. And, yeah, be cool. um, you know, the item upgrade system is something that we want to make sure if it's not on the very first PTR, it's not long after, okay. right? We, we know we want to get that into players' hands as soon as possible uh, to be able to play around with that, give us feedback, and give us time to iterate on that. God, dude. Okay. Another system that's coming in. It's such a good day to be a WoW fan. Class set bonuses, obviously, are continuing forward. Narratively, these ones are all going to be Black Dragonflight, you know, okay. themed and, and stuff. I guess I have a couple of questions. First of all, how are you planning on topping the names of the set bonus, the items and the, you know, the flavor of the ones from the Vault of the Incarnates? Because I don't know how many more vocabulary words I can learn before, <laughs> before we're, uh, <laughs> we're out of the dictionary, right? Thesaurus.com is a powerful tool, man. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, something that's really exciting about the new set bonuses that are coming with Avarice is they've actually taken... Actually, did you get a chance to see, like, a like a picture of them? Yeah, yeah, we saw yeah, all 12, yeah. So 13. epic, and, you know, when you, if, when you look at those, it's not a coincidence that they're kind of evocative of some of the sets that you might have seen in previous expansions, you know? Like, we recognize that Avarice, um, the, this laboratory, is... You know, this is kind of the blueprint for places like Blackwing Descent and Blackwing Lair, right? Like, this is what came first. So kind of revisiting that from um, you know a story perspective was really exciting for us to get the opportunity to to kind of revisit some of those um, sets that are kind of fan favorites okay. and really update them and refresh them because it really felt like a great uh, thematic hook there. We saw we saw Scarzar was talking about this on Twitter a couple weeks back. I, I I was wondering like where he was going with that. I thought he was I thought he was just looking for like good naming ideas and stuff like that. But it makes it makes sense. With this How about in terms answer? of the mechanical complexity of those set bonuses? I know that the start of the expansion. We have this new talent system. We have a lot of stuff going on, and so the set bonuses were purposefully kept toned down a little bit. Is that something that talent system is still here? So maybe it still needs to be a little bit toned down. So uh, whenever he says toned down, what he means is like, okay, so, and and this is something that we was discussed a little bit. I mean, the expansion. There is a world where a lot of set bonuses could interact specifically with talents, right? And then that that forces the players themselves to. Like, if you're not talented into something, then you're going to get zero value out of your set bonus. But that seems kind of weird. In addition to that, okay, are, is there ever going to be an opportunity for, like, set bonuses to be put at, like, these later nodes? Um, be, be tied into something that that is attached, you know, in Karn as opposed to Celestial Alignment. Or be attached to something, you know, like Fury Villain as opposed to whatever, right? Where you have to absolutely have something talented for you to be able to even get benefit out of it. Like, that, that was always a question of, like, is Blizzard going to ever look to do that? Is that something that they should be looking to do where it, it forces you to uh, pick a specific build or specific path that um, you otherwise maybe wouldn't have picked in that, in that situation. That's kind of what we're talking power, about. You know, right. wacky we, stuff. We, we are still, so definitely not, you know, we're, we're, we're not to Sepulchre okay. levels of. Sepulchre had by far the most overpowered set bonuses of all time. Typically, set bonuses were, were, were within the 6 to 12% damage gain range. Sepulchres were within the 20 to 45% in some situations damage gain range. Of set bonus. But yes, it's definitely dialed up a, a, a notch, right? But we do want to be very, um, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like intentional with how much complexity we're adding there, okay. especially with the new talent system. Like its ability, like sets is, sets is? Your sets ability to impact what talent build. Like we really want to be careful about f saying like, okay, well you got four piece. This is literally your only talent choices. 
if you deviate from this, you're doing it wrong. So we want to be careful go. with how much good, interaction those sets have. Good answer. Um, and how much it's impacting. Good the answer. Um, but definitely, I would say it's been dialed up a notch, as well as kind of some of the tuning targets have been um, increased as well. Okay, so it sounds like some of them, some of them are they're willing to make you play a specific talent, but it it doesn't make it seem like you're going to be locked into a build and the ones that you were forced to play a specific talent, which is kind of cool. I think that that's uh, super good because like if you think about it, a lot most of the talent builds for a lot of specs coming into uh, coming into ten point one, you know, or ten point oh weren't weren't super complex, and I think that it makes sense that they're willing to now that people have been antiquated with the the talent system as a whole they're willing to kind of ramp that up a little bit um just to really make sure that like okay you're going to replace your previous set bonus with these because the set bonus is tuning targets a little bit higher as well oh that's a good point okay i want to pivot back to story for a little bit here oh my god story out steve's back too much of this and i want to talk about the the black dragonflight leadership clash that i've been participating in i've handed rathian several hundred keys uh and hopefully that's helping him out is that something that's planning to progress or reach a conclusion? Is there going to be a, a leader of the Black Dragonflight emerging here? I can see there's a, a Rathian in your background there. Is that, uh, is that a spoiler? Uh, it is not a spoiler other than the fact that he is involved in the storyline. Um, yeah, delving delving underground, is that delving a spoiler? into Eltharian's past and, and examining the road he took from the Earth Warder to becoming Deathwing. Um, that definitely involves these characters that we've gotten to know, and we've known Rathian for a while, but the ability to reintroduce Sibelian and Dragonflight and show how these two characters contrast one another, uh, that's been really fun. And then, you know, the, the, the third leg of that table has been Abyssian, who's been much more quiet um, and kind of letting these two do things out. But um, in 1007, we'll see Abyssian spending a lot of time with Emberthal and kind of helping her on her journey to understand what the Drakthir's legacy is and, and what their future could be. Um, so all three of those Black Dragons will be in the mix um, in the underground, and all three of them have perspectives on uh, what Neltharian's legacy was and, and what it means. And um, yeah, that that journey will be uh, very much front and center in the, in the questing of the uh, the campaign chapters in Zerilak. So it'll be fun to see that story continue and their relationships uh, continue to evolve and in new and and perhaps some surprising turns there. Cool. How about the fractures between the aspects that, you know, the uh, incarnates are looking to exploit here? We, of course, we know at some point in the future, Nas Dormu is going to have his Morazund moment and uh, is that something that's coming soon or that we're we're building towards now? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you've as you've spent time with Nizdormu and in, in the in the Dragonflight questing, uh, you know that this is weighing heavily on his mind, and the infinites are still out there. Um, and then the incarnates uh, would love to sow dissent among the aspects and and keep them on their heels. So all of these stories are kind of swirling around together. And they all will have their their moments in the in the Dragonflight story arc. But right now, um, our attention turns underground. But um, some of these other storylines are are very much uh, um, will be unfolding in the in the future here. Yeah, and that's I fun. think that I think that this is actually one of one of the uh, most interesting storylines for WoW that I've seen. Normally, I could not care less about lore. I think that lore is you know really whatever to me. Um, but I think that this has definitely been an expansion where the lore has been at least more cohesive enough to where I can follow it as somebody who does not give a shit about lore. One of the cool things about kind of the Dragonflight content cadence is, you know, we've got these updates like, you know, uh, I'm not sure, Steve, if you mentioned like the uh, 1007 update, there's this story with the Black Dragons is also going to have some progression there. And Ooh, when we were talking about 1007, just philosophically, like what goes into a 1007? Like what is the goal of this patch? One of the major things that we discussed was just the opportunity. I love the patch cadence for this expansion. What was coming. Patch right? cadence like, is so sick for this you know, expansion. You've got this awesome, um, you know, space where the Drakthir have kind of originated and there's some stories that still are left to be told there. And how can we plant some seeds that will lead us into the Zerilek Caverns and make that kind of flow together? Um, and like Steve mentioned, that also means that we've got space to explore other stories in some of these content updates outside of just our major seasonal rollover patches. There's 
awesome opportunities uh, for, for future us as well to, um, you know, dive into this space. I think I think that this is, I think that the content pacing, in in Dragonflight in general has been one of the the big high points for me. It's like, okay, so ten point zero point five, it it didn't have like a, a ton of content, but it something it brought was like the ability to be able to retune classes. They they brought out some reworks in ten point zero point seven. We're getting forbidden. In the Forbidden Reach is a zone that we're going to uh, go into, and we're also getting this ring that we have to farm out. On top of that, Rep Paladins are getting a rework. And then after that, we're getting 10.1, which should be so sick. I think that all of that stuff is super, super cool. And I think it makes... Um, one, of the, one of my biggest criticisms about Shadowlands was the pacing felt off, and it felt wrong. And that has been rectified a lot with Dragonflight. Okay, so speaking, this is going to be a little bit of a stretch, but speaking of little stories that were told, there were these two very rare rings in Vault of the Incarnus that sort of had this bond between Aranog <laughs> and Broodkeeper. In general, these very rare items were uh, really impactful, really powerful. They had this item level bump associated with them. They had this extreme rarity attached. What a fucking reach, by the way. <laughs> them. Is that something that you're happy with? Is that something that we can expect to see very rare items in Aberus in a similar way? Yeah, totally. So I guess the two parts of that. One is just itemization's role and ability to tell stories is always really exciting. Like I love when the rewards team has the opportunity to to really plant little seeds like that. I also love, you know, every week, you know, one of the rings drops that the Tuscar want and someone's like, dibs, and I'm like, <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, I just love those opportunities to tell stories with the rewards in the game and the items. Um, but in terms of the system of, you know, those uh, different tiers of uh, rewards. Not only, I would say, like you mentioned, there's kind of those like more rare items, like the Drakthir staff. Um, those rings were also really exciting. Uh, the bow, the Razagath bow, which, you know, it was a big forum post recently. Oh, <laughs> real, um, real. Those are, we think, really have been successful, right? Like they give you kind of that opportunity to have that item that it's you're really excited successful. to see week over week. Okay. Um, and gives you that kind of stretch goal and also has some impact on maybe what your choices in your Great Vault are. Okay. Um, so we definitely think that those have been successful, as well as having that more um, granular tiers of just r rewards as you progress through the raid as well. We really felt like that did a great job of um, more accurately corresponding to the level of, I think. Uh, let's just say, difficulty, right? Like, like okay, we know the emboss is harder. Let's give it a big bump. We know the you know, the, the bosses that are like wing bosses are more difficult. Let's give them a bump. Um, so that's definitely something that we're carrying forward into Avarice. I think that he'll... Okay, I understand where he's coming from. Let me think. So he's looking at it as like, okay, this is uh, granular loot. I think that the the very rare items end up landing in a good spot because people have heavy desire for them but for the players they look at them and they're like everybody in the whole entire raid needs you know an icon everybody in the entire raid needs an aeronaut ring everybody in the entire raid needs a broodkeeper ring that's tough that's a that's a really tough one right because they have these secondary effects they're so powerful and they and an icon situation they're very polarizing with the amount of dps that you're able to gain and and while it does impact maybe potentially your vault choices I don't know, man. It's it's tough. It's tough whenever all twenty, you know, even even higher in flex rating situations, players in your raid want it. That's a, that's a tough one. I don't know. It 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 is. It's kind of like a replacement for you know war forging and stuff like that. But it's 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 unfortunate that they're low drop. They're low drop rate, but one hundred percent of the players want it. Because if you think about things like grief torch, grief torch isn't very isn't very rare, but every player wants it. At the same, or not every player, but like all melee want it, for example. Um, it, this is a weird one, and I think that like no deterministic loot definitely hurts this a bit. I think that I understand this from where Morgan's approaching it, but I, I am interested in like what it would look like if we had either a deterministic way of uh, being able to acquire gear. You know that I think that that would help alleviate a lot of these these issues with you know. We're 12 weeks into the patch or whatever, and I still don't have an icon. That's that's a problem. Like, you don't need... I think that, like, expectations of being able to get your absolute bis are, is a bit wrong, but at the same point, not having the opportunity, realistically, to get this item 12 weeks into the patch also feels 
Okay. Goody. In ten point, I don't know, zero point five, we have it's this a weird, druid. There's minor. a weird expectation. Hold on. Uh, there, just just another point. There's is, there's a weird expectation of the player base to be able to always have the opportunity to get bis gear regardless of what you do. Um, but I think that yeah, I think that the problem is certainly almost how powerful they are. That seems. That seems work true. to the talent tree. Ten point zero point seven paladins getting a moderate ret focused you know set of changes. Are there any classes that are looking at getting something of that size in 10.1? Or are those are, are talent changes of that size mostly being saved for these minor patches to let the other content come in in the in the major patches? Um, yeah, there's definitely changes that are going to be happening with Embers of Neltharion that are more significant on the class side of things. Um, like you said, like you mentioned, the the Rep Paladin rework was pretty substantial in 10.07. Um, we do try to be careful about you know how much change we make there. At a certain point, we you know we need to be really careful about. Yeah, I mean, obviously they're not necessary, the seasons, but are we gonna like they are nice. blow up the leaderboard by making some of these changes? So we do try to be really considerate with that. Whereas a seasonal rollover is is a, a bit of a larger reset, so it definitely affords us opportunities to make um, some more significant changes, especially where you might be moving things around the talent tree. Uh, in terms of like a large er rework, um, I would say probably shadow. Priest is getting a, a pretty significant amount of work done. Ooh, wait, 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 in, what? Uh, the Embers of Neltharion update. Um, Dude, okay, this is wait, 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 wait. <laughs> wait. <laughs> Priest is getting another update in in ten one. Priest is Priest suffers a lot from button bloat. That that spec has. 18 rotational buttons or some bullshit that they have to deal with, right? That and and I am I am I for one am shocked that Blizzard has taken the time to rework Shadow Priest one more time. If you can't tell I'm kidding because they literally always reworks Priest. I, I, I joke with the team like someday we'll get the whole expansion without reworking Shadow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, real, real lore, real lore, real lore, uh, real lore. Uh, we, we get a lot of feedback on and want to make some significant changes. Holy too. fuck! So people will definitely see a lot of this stuff uh, as soon as the PTR comes out um, this upcoming week. You know, it, we... the other things that are kind of on my list for like reworks, and I kind of hope they look to change is like, uh, you know, shamans. I think that like Ellie in particular not having a raid buff is is tough. I think that Hunter in particular not having a raid buff is tough. I think that DK not having a raid buff is really bad. I think that those are the things that would also be on my list, but the, I don't think that those are on my list because they need like a Shadow Shadow is on the list because they have infinite button bloat, like an 18 button rotation. And while it does like feels good to play, um it, it's a bit complex at times. I think that that's a tough one, but I I think that there's also some things that they could rework without having to do like a full design change of how these effects function you a, a lot of these class changes um have been things that we've talked about and you know when we talk about hey is this appropriate for 1005 we might say like no that's really something that needs to exist on a seasonal boundary let's make some changes in 10 1 not in you know 10 or 7 or whatever it might be so um i'm down significant class down changes, for that morgan uh, in 10 1 good and, take good you know, take really consistent with the philosophy that we've tried to communicate where you know talents is just rebuilding a strong foundation that we can continue to iterate and invest in for the future and you know uh em embers um of Neltharion will be no exception there all right final question patch release date obviously we know 10.0.7 is coming kind of soon now on june 6th there's another game coming out that i and several of my friends intend to play quite a bit of where we venture into hell slay some demons that kind of stuff is that something that's going to be mutually exclusive with playing all the embers and eltharian content uh as well or is there a plan Ooh. to let me do both of those he's asking about the date this feels like a trick like someone <laughs> is trying to uh draw us into answering a question about a date that we aren't talking about yet yeah. but um <laughs> You know, certainly, uh, you know, we, we are aware of our, our fellow colleagues on other teams and their upcoming releases. Dude, look and at Morgan's face whenever it gets asked, us into, too. This feels like a trick, like someone is <laughs> trying to uh, draw us into answering a question about Holy a date that we are talking Holy that's about so yet. good. Yeah. But, um, you know, that certainly, uh, you know, we, we are aware of our, our fellow troll. colleagues on other teams and their upcoming releases. And that's definitely something we will be keeping in mind when it comes to uh, when we put out uh, Embers of Neltharion, but don't have anything specific to tell you in that regard today. 
Other than I'm excited about Diablo 4 as well. Yes. <laughs> we all want to kill demons too. So we're 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 ready to go. Cool. All right. Well, thank you both very much for your time. Is that uh... all right? That was a really good interview. I think that that was like a super sick interview. I think that both Morgan and Steve did a great job. You know, there's. I think that Dratnus did a great job of uh, wording these questions, and I think that we we actually learned a lot about not only like what dungeons we are uh, receiving, but in addition to that, I think that just like some of the design decisions. That's is really really interesting to hear hear them talk through their thought process on some of the stuff. Uh, some of the stuff we're seeing. Yeah, everyone go like this video. I like I like this video already. But yeah, everybody go like this video. What do I comment? Wow, Dratnus. This was an absolute banger. There we go. Comment.